Welcome back to the Fast Life Podcast, which is brought to you by Simpson Motorcycle Helmets. Simpson is known for their iconic and aggressive style, which has always stood out amongst other helmets. Simpson has been continuously supplying us with quality built helmets that offer many different models, finishes, and visor options to fit your taste. Head on over to SimpsonMotorcycleHelmets.com to check out all they have for you and give these guys a follow at Simpson Motorcycle Helmets on the gram. On today's episode, we have Boosted Brad. He's been on the podcast before, but honestly, he was like one of the first 20 or 30 uh, episodes, so it's been a good long time since we've had him on the pod, and I'm uh, happy to bring him back on for you guys. So let's jump into these sponsors, and we're going to jump right into this episode. House of Harley-Davidson, located in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, has your HD covered with the performance upgrades we all want along with service, sales, and a stacked parts department. Head on over to houseofharley.com where you can order the parts you need for your bike along with all the best gear and clothing available. Drop the Fast Life offer code to save yourself 13% on your online purchases and give these guys a follow at House of Harley on Instagram. Lexan Moto is my Bluetooth headset company and has been for over three years now. The quality and sound and battery life make those long days on the open road much more enjoyable. Their latest headset, the G16, is designed to make group rides much better with a 16 rider comm system, Bluetooth 5.0, music sharing, and fast USB-C charging. Among the many things Lexan does for our motor community, they also offer the best customer service in the industry. The team at Lexan just dropped their new Lexan Smart Tire Pump as well, which is a portable tire pump that can fit easily in your saddlebags. Check out lexan-moto.com to see all the awesome products which are all designed to make life on two wheels better. And don't forget to drop the Fast Life offer code at checkout to save yourself 15%. And lastly, give these guys a follow on Instagram at lexanmoto. Thundermax and their ECM computers are designed to provide your EFI-equipped Harley-Davidson with the most advanced auto-tuning on the market. And they just released their modules for the 2021 and up HD models. A Thundermax ECM eliminates tuning hassles when upgrading your exhaust or air cleaner or when adding a cam or big bore kit. Thundermax is also in the suspension game with their iRide rear suspension. This is a performance air ride which gives you the ability to adjust many aspects from the handlebar mounted touchscreen. This rear suspension is the best of both worlds. Check out these products at shoptmax.com and use offer code FASTLIFE to save yourself 10% off and follow Thundermax EFI on Instagram. I have been riding with Lucky Dave's seats and handlebars on almost all my bikes since 2016, and I'm happy to announce their partnership with us here at the Fast Life Podcast. Their seats have always been the perfect fit for my ass and with that trademark styling that I have come to love from the LD brand. Lucky Dave's also has some of the most dope handlebar options from their classic San Diego bar to their Peacemaker bar and riser combos. They got what you need. I'm personally running the Peacemaker bars on both my T-Sport and Bagger. Head on over to LuckyDaves.com to check out all of their options for your HD and grab yourself some swag while you're there. And lastly, give my guys a follow on Instagram at LuckyDaves. Now here's Boosted Brad from Death Metal Racing. Let's go. Hey guys, you ready to let the dogs out? Fast Life Podcast. All right, bro. We're rolling. Okay. What's up? <laughs> What's up, dude? Oh, man. Same old, same old. I'm glad glad to, glad you can make this work with me. I'm passing through, headed to Nashville, and I just wanted to, you know, originally when I was thinking about going to um, uh, House of Harley for the industry party and the block party or whatever they're doing up there, uh, right. hometown rally, uh-huh. I was trying to... Uh, like I had this whole setup to go do a, a run on the way back through Iowa. I even talked to Frank speed dealer about uh-huh. stopping through there to have him on the podcast. And, uh, I was trying to look at coming here and then bouncing over to Kyle's over, you know, just South of St. Louis and then going like, I was just trying to figure out how to do everything. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you're the only one that was on the trip that still works on this trip, you know? <laughs> right. So, but yeah, no, yeah. man, the new shop, man, it's, it's, it's badass And, Thank you. Dude, you've been pumping out some bikes too, man. Yeah, we, we, we've been trying to, you know, just being a basically a one-man show. It's yeah. a little tough and kind of slow, but yeah, I just uh, tore down that bagger over there. 
yesterday and day before me and my son and that's kind of going to be the next project and uh, i'm having a lot of problems finding motivation to get on that because i'm more of a minimalistic you know yeah. stripped down bare bones but uh, I need to build one. You know, we're making a lot of parts for those things, and I have a lot more ideas in my head that I want to come out with, but i yeah. got to have a bike here to kind of yeah, make, sense. make that happen. Uh, so. Yeah, I was going to ask you, because, I, I mean, I, I know that you've built baggers in the past, but uh, over the last couple of years, I mean, the FXRs and the, and the Dynas, it seems like have been, and the Sportster. Right, <laughs> seems yeah. Seems like it's been, like, the, uh, the main thing coming out of the shop. So I Yeah, I, I just... I really want to do an FXR chopper, but the bagger market's so hot, and uh, we're doing so many parts for the baggers, and I just kind of want to do one my style, you know, mm -hmm. what I like. And uh, um, You ready to paint it? Yeah, not ready to, but I'm going to. <laughs> we just tore that thing down, like I said yesterday, and it was so many pieces and those new bikes and that's the first yeah. one i'd really torn into that deep yeah and uh man the whole time i'm working on it, i was like did i really want to do this did i really want to do yeah, this you yeah. know but there's a lot of guys that you know kyle's one of them that's putting out some killer bikes mm -hmm. and uh i just uh he kind of talked me into doing one he kept telling me i need to do one i need to do one yeah. so i finally broke down and bought one yeah when you have one in here you can start like really diving in and looking at all the areas as, as to where you can make your parts exactly. and changes and modifying it and that's really what the bagger scene needs right now is uh you know just we just need more options right you know that way you know because it's still the performance scene is still kind of young in that world mm -hmm. so you know the more parts and the styles that we get out there the more we can kind of not make these look all the same right right you know what i mean and, and that's that's what i was struggling with because i was looking through a lot of instagram pictures trying to get inspiration and it's just a lot of them look like the same bike with a different paint job and i'm not knocking anybody it's just really hard you know it's a good platform it looks good it mm. rides good uh but it's just really hard to do it really really different you know <laughs> and uh but uh like i said we're, we're gonna tackle it we're gonna see what we come up yeah. with it's tough, man. I mean, even like when Justin, my machinist, did his yeah, build, his bike was killer. You know, he was you know obviously having a CNC in your garage <laughs> yeah is uh, helpful for those kind of things. But it, it's just difficult to come up with like you know like how you're not taking a shitty bike and making it better. You're taking a really great bike, right? And you know at least with FXRs, like you, going with newer products. I mean, you're talking about forty year old bike, a thirty yeah. year old bike. So you make a new part for that. It's like fuck yeah. It's like we're updating it. It's right. a resto mod kind of vibe, you know, but yeah. a brand new bagger. Like, what do you, <laughs> yeah, I know it's, it's like I said, and it's not knocking anybody. It's just so much of it has already been done. You yeah. know, so many guys and they're doing so much crazy stuff with these things. It's just mm -hmm. like, well, where'd I go? You know, and that's kind of where I'm at right now. And my, it'll probably change 20 mm -hmm. times between now and the time I actually yeah. start painting the bike, you know, uh, but uh, I don't know. Like I said, we're going to tackle it and try to come up with some new parts. And uh, we've got a few ideas. And so we'll, we'll see. I'd like to have it done for Daytona. Uh, but just being a small crew, it's kind of hard to do, yeah, yeah. you know. You going to frame off on it or take pull the motor I, all that or what? I was thinking about that, but I kind of want to use it as a platform for the new parts too so i'm mm -hmm. always kind of going to be working on it trying different stuff so i don't know that i'm going to take it down to the frame i think yeah, we're just going to do you know leave the frame black um do the motor work my buddy paul from fuel moto is coming down oh yeah yeah and uh he's going to do the motor for me while i knock out the paint hell yeah some of those no, paul's a good dude yeah he yeah. is really good guy yeah no that'd be cool man it'd be uh, like i said it'd be great man when you drop this fxr do you, you you unveiled it at Loretta Lens this year, right? Let's or was see. it Daytona? I think Daytona, it was Daytona was the first, yeah. I, I felt like, I mean, I don't know, just going through social media, like using that because I wasn't at Daytona. Right. I don't know if people were sleeping on that, but that fucker right there is badass. Thank you. It, it was uh, like I saw the pictures of it and, you know, the carbon wrap tank. Uh, it's it's wrapped right, like, right? Yeah, yeah Kyle, Kyle uh, forever had, yeah. yeah, he did the tank for me, tank and headlight, yeah. And so like I I was just like. Everybody was talking about the, I guess, you know, Kyle had all those baggers coming out, right. you know, uh, RG Destroyer's bike and things like that. So it was kind of like very loud, you know, paint jobs yeah. and stuff out there that was uh, kind of overshadowing stuff. And 
you know, like you just said a while ago, you're minimalistic. So it takes a real eye to maybe not so much this FXR, but it does take an eye to look at everything. It's not like some flashy, right? You know, thing. So yeah. I, I don't know. I felt like it was. I hate to say slept on, but because I'm sure that people notice it and and you got a lot of praise for it. But it, I don't know. I, it was one of my favorite builds Thank from you. Daytona. Oh, um, it. I kind of kept it under wraps for a long time i didn't uh -huh. post any pictures of it at all and i just kind of wanted to bring it out once it was done and that's mm -hmm. what i did and uh we took it to daytona literally just finished the bike cranked it up rode it down the street and back loaded up in the trailer took it to daytona nice. and uh we took it down there and it was we had a huge uh positive response uh i mean it just nice. it blew up we had people coming up to us all the time people in the industry you know just average everyday customers and we had uh, a really really good response and then john from uh puts on the hardcore cycle show he come up to me after we had won and he said won best to show and he said yeah. that's the first non-bagger bike that's ever won that show it's always okay. been a bagger yeah. and uh he said i think it was don't quote me but i think it was 15 judges and he said 12 out of the 15 picked it for best to show and it was all nice. guys that were in the industry which you know you kind of look up to and yeah, yeah they know what they're looking at and uh it was uh it was a big honor you know we oh, were blown dope. away we took to that show then we took it to the v twin visionary show and the um choppers magazine show that was chopper choppers magazine and fxr yeah, bazaar yeah. together and we won best to show on that uh, we won Best FXR at the V-Twin Vis Visionary Show. And, uh, man, we just got a lot of praise on that bike. Oh, okay. Everybody was freaking out on it. Good. I, I, like I said, I wasn't there, so I didn't get to see or notice it. But yeah. I guess I judged everything based on uh, social media and right. you know, like how things are getting reposted around and yeah. shit. So. Yeah. But, yeah, no, it, it was it's well-deserved because it was badass. Thank it you. It is badass. That's yeah. the only bike that I've gotten paid for on a reel on Instagram. Oh, for real? Yeah, nice. yeah. So I've gotten a couple of checks from Instagram. It wasn't a lot. You know, it was 100 150 bucks, but yeah. every little bit helps, you know. Yeah, exactly. I, I haven't gotten paid on anything else since, you know, <laughs> so I'll take it. Yeah, that's uh, – yeah, the reels thing is funny because uh, I don't really like that kind of content. Yeah, I don't either. Um, but it's like, fuck, you know. For earlier this year, I was I was going hard with that stuff, and I was getting a little hundred dollar check, two hundred dollar check here and there. Yeah. And then uh, I don't know. I just don't. To me, I feel like that's ruining Instagram. Yeah. To be with you. And it takes a lot, you know, to constantly come up with content and sitting down and editing it. Now my, you know, fifteen year old daughter, she can knock it out in probably ten yeah, minutes. Yeah. <laughs> but me, no, not so much. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's the other thing. Is like I, I sometimes I feel like I I care too much and I'm trying too hard. Yep. And trying to polish it out so much when it's like you just post a video. It's like reels took place a story. So now so stories yeah. don't do anything. Just fucking post like whatever that 15 second video was. You wasn't gonna put in the story. Just make it a reel. Yeah. Put music behind it and you know click that uh, monetize button. Right. You know what I mean? Right. Exactly. <laughs> that's cool though. You got quite a few FXRs in here, man. You got a lot of projects <laughs> or what? Uh, yeah. These that. builds. FXRP, that's a pretty rare model. It's got the dual exhaust on it mm. from the factory. Really rare paint. It's the white with the blue. That was a Cobb County Sheriff bike. Uh, the one on the other side is FXRP. Um, then I've got the white FXRP outside that I took to Daytona this year and mm -hmm. my FXRT. So, yeah, I've got, I've got several point. FXRs. Well, I like how you did you use uh, Denton's fairing on that FXR? Yes. So uh -huh. that, it, that looks really good on there. Yeah. It, I'm still waiting to see someone try to fit some sport glide bags on an FXR. I think it can yeah, be done. Yeah. I think it'll look good on there. Yeah, that. I think so too. Like a modern clamshell kind of vibe. Yeah. I've had several people since we did that put that fairing on there. We made the brackets and everything for it. And uh, wanting to put those on FXRs on the 39 millimeter, and yeah. I told him, man, you got to come out with the brackets because these things look killer on these. It does, and a yeah. lot of people are really digging it, and so yeah. he's supposed to be coming out with the brackets for those for the narrow glides. That'll be good because you know, like T Sport fairings are they're kind of played out yeah. with all the knockoff ones, and then getting an original T Sport fairing now is like you know with, with the trees and everything like i've seen them going for like four grand oh yeah it's nuts it's insane it's like way more than rt fairing is right nice. right uh, and they're they're becoming more and more rare because they only had them for three years mm -hmm. and uh only on one model is you know what i mean yeah like it's they're just getting harder to find and uh 
but like I used to want to do a T Sport front end uh, on like a FXR, but I want it to be all original T Sport stuff, yeah, not like yeah. a Conley's or any of that stuff. Right. You know what I mean? So I just don't know if I could. Uh, every time I get around to wanting to do another FXR, I, I get excited, and then I just lose interest in it real really? quick. Yeah, it's like the FXR that I want, the the type, the the two that I really want to do now is the chopper fxr uh-huh. you know like motorcycle dork josh and hell even like bare knuckle paul's like those are just so bad yeah. and like this year's fxr show at sturgis was just stacked with badass bikes yes it was crazy you know? it was insane and then also be, becoming friends with Corey from main drive cycles that did yeah. the uh, m8 fxr mm-hmm. man i kind of want it <laughs> yeah he uh he killed it with that bike it was it was bad that's, yeah that's one we chose for best to show yeah for real? and Corey, he's a he's a good guy that's actually my first time i think ever meeting him and i was really impressed because he's just down to earth humble guy yeah. you know try to get him to say a cuss word once oh yeah he he's he's like the most he's he's like the best version of a human really yeah like i can see that like when he comes on the podcast he says things like shoot yeah yeah <laughs> it's so cute <laughs> <laughs> he's a good guy he's such a good dude yeah and uh and, and i'm i'm really happy for him because he he really took his time building this last bike and it shows and it shows and it, it what it really does is it shows like the the level of like the level of build that you can cut anybody could come out with with patience yeah like if you really did take a year or two to build a bike just imagine like the the idea is how it can morph from maybe where you started to where it ended and stuff yeah. like that. You know, now we're just kind of like, now we're just waiting on parts. Right. You know yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's... How has it been with you with like all the shortages and stuff like that? Have you, has it affected you much? Or? A little bit in the very beginning. Uh, we started having a little, you know, a few issues getting materials. Now we can, we can pretty much get the materials, but everything keeps going up. And yeah. now, like our polishers, everything, inflation has affected so much. Like our polishers, um, they've got to pay their employees more money to get to work because gas is so high. Uh, same way with anodizers and everything from the material cost, employee costs, all the way down the chain. It just keeps adding more money yeah. to the parts. And some of it we try to absorb and not go up on prices, but then it just starts stacking up. And it's just like, is it ever going to stop? You yeah. know, just the other day we had to go up five bucks on seat screws. You know, they were nineteen ninety five, and now they're twenty four ninety on a seat screw. You know, <laughs> just because the polishing charges more, the material went up, and now anodizing is charging more. You know, Fuck, man. it's crazy. It's so it, it's it it blows my mind how we had such a almost everybody made it, made out like a bandit through COVID because maybe right. they got the money, which is now we're all paying the price for yeah, it now. Exactly. Um, and it's like it, it just sucks that like the inflation of how things have become because it's happened. I mean, you paint as well. Like yeah. you know how that is. Yeah. It's like insane how much everything goes up, and it's all, you know, when you paint something like as you know, like it's not one thing you buy. You know, it's not like one block of metal and then you put yes. it in the machine. It's forty different chemicals and right. and twelve different uh, you know types of sandpaper and twenty different types of tape and yeah. You know, and it just like each one of those is each one of those five dollars more. That's an extra five hundred dollars on the bill. Yeah, or on the on the paint bill. And uh, man, it's just you know I, I've been telling people a lot, and I try to say it on the podcast a lot so people understand. It's like ten thousand dollars is not a lot of money anymore it's on not, a paint job. Not, you know, it's just what I was going to say when you were talking about that. My point was going to be how ten thousand dollars used to be. You know, it's a pretty decent price, and you're getting paid well. And yeah. now with the cost of everything man you could eat up ten thousand dollars real quick real quick you know and uh you know and it's a it's a it's sticker shock for sure yeah. um but at the same time it's like well what do you i mean when when paint jobs get to the point where we have to charge 15 grand yeah if the way things keep going i mean it's only gonna be a couple of years before we have I to know. do that that's half of what a brand new motorcycle costs yes so i, I i'm fearful of the industry getting phased out yeah and i mean the guys that work at like body shops that can kind of throw some materials out the side of it, yeah, those guys will probably be able to still paint bikes, right? Yeah. But standalone custom paint shops, like bike paint shops, that, yeah. it's going to be tough to keep yeah. that kind of thing alive. It, it is, it is. I was uh, just the other day. I was looking at the new mid controls uh, company come out with their billet. You know, they're really nice looking, and we had been talking about for years coming out with their own billet mid controls. Mm-hmm. 
and HHI is who it is, and they're a really good looking mid control. And, uh, you know, I clicked on the price just to kind of see what their price point was. And, you know, for a set of anodized mid controls, it's 24, 2,500 bucks, you yeah. know? Yeah. And I'm like, I remember when we were paying a thousand dollars for a set of Ford billet mid controls, you know, it sound like an old man, but yeah. <laughs> you know, paid a thousand bucks. And now these things, how many people are going to keep paying this kind of money, you know, yeah. for this stuff? It, it worries me, you know, kind of, is it going to be, Another. Yeah, because not all of us have. I mean, it hasn't necessarily. I mean, it's it's a it's a political argument, right? Where you're talking about all the inflation and everything going up, and how much more can people do before they're exactly. just like it, the price out of the water? Yes, you yes. know. And I'm worried that we're starting to get to that point. You know mm. that it's it's gonna it's got a peak. I mean, it can't just well, keep going. I mean, I've always looked at it like this: like if let's say you're doing the mid controls, and let's just say it's a two thousand dollars set of mid controls. If you really are going and doing the the full nines on on the on your say a bagger, mm -hmm. you're going to the nines on, you know, rear pegs, front pegs, or, or front floorboards, all the shifter stuff. Like you're two grand. Easy. Oh yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Quick. So it's still similar. It's just right. like at least when you buy like a whole kit, you're opening up a bunch of different boxes. Right, right. Like oh shit, this is the floorboards. These are the back pegs. These are the shifter pegs. Yeah. And, so you got all these little cool packages. When you buy a set of mid controls, it's like yeah, one uh -huh. one box. Yeah, that would be that'd be tough. I mean, yeah, it'd be rough. But yeah, that's kind of where we're at today. But you know the, I I prefer the mid controls on the baggers over anything. It's just really tough with the exhaust stuff. And, yeah, and I know it's hard to to you know for for a mid control company, or for someone making mid controls, it's like it's pretty hard to make something that's modular. Right that would fit every exhaust or yeah. could move in some kind of way because it, it, it's just too many exhaust options out there. You know right, I mean? right. And most of the exhausts that were made uh, for the baggers, they're all made around floorboards, you know. And so where that rear head pipe normally turns is right where a traditional mid control, you know, you see Ness come out with some mid controls and they're kind of like uh, further forward yeah. mids almost. Yeah. They're not really true mids. Yeah. But they'll bolt up and go around the stock pipe but uh it's there's a few companies you know hpi's spb fab uh basani uh, our men's work like the two two brothers racing maybe a few others but uh yeah it really limits you uh yeah. as to what you can run you know when you go with mid control but there are more companies that are kind of starting to cater to yeah for sure the performance guys i, I think uh you know, with like the HHI ones, I was actually having a, this conversation with a good friend of mine yesterday. He has a set of drop kicks on his that, mm -hmm. that like Kyle has on a lot of his bikes right. and stuff. Um, well, this is my, I know you, technically you shouldn't be standing up on your mid controls. Right. But I feel like when you have them bolted to like the, the covers like that and then like cantilevered out, mm -hmm. just the leverage, like if you were to getting back like if you're ripping corners and you're kind of sliding back and forth you're technically putting all your weight on those mid controls mm -hmm. which i feel like that scares me more than anything really? as opposed to like like the way yours bolt up mm -hmm. uh, on the uh primary side and then right. i don't know how yours bolt up on the uh on the uh uh exhaust side they mount up to the transmission okay the, yeah. the, the uh, trap it goes door on the, bolts yeah so the trap door bolts it's like it's still under your feet like uh -huh. it's still bolted under you as opposed right. to right being hung out there you yeah. know what i'm saying yeah so yeah that's just me with my dumb math in my head right i don't think it's real but i don't know that's just what i think of yeah yeah i don't know i've never ridden one of those bikes with those type of mids uh just hours and maybe one other but uh yeah i used to have guys that were kind of concerned about the left side where it bolts to the primary because it is four quarter inch bolts that are really long yeah um but you know back in the day harley they made the inspection plate on like their super glides low riders and it had a foot peg on the inspection plate and it mm -hmm. mounted to that and it was held on with four quarter inch bolts you know which okay. it was a shovel head you know it was an old bike and they fell apart and everything else but <laughs> they held up you know you'd see guys standing on those things and yeah. they never had any issues with them pulling out so i felt pretty confident and we haven't had any nice either. that's awesome so, yeah yeah, well, I mean, I've seen your your mid controls on on a lot of bikes over the last couple of years, and uh, hell, the the 
the risers, the pegs. I mean, it's unique to to you. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, like, you can see those fuckers across the parking lot. <laughs> um, hell, it, like, Big Trouble's bikes always seem to, you know. Yeah. Every time I post that picture, a couple of those pictures I took of him at the Lakeland show. Uh-huh. It's like an instant like boost on my social media, and I hate giving him that kind of credit. <laughs> you know what I mean? But right, he's he's just like an old man that that like he just looks cool. Yeah, you know what I mean, and yeah. his bike looks cool. He looks cool, and it's a it's a it's a great like connection on the right. pictures, and people yeah. love it. So he, he's a good guy, and uh, yeah, you're talking about his Dyna. Yeah, the Dyna. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love that bike. Yeah. Does he still have it? No, he sold it like right at Daytona this year. Okay. And apparently, whoever got it dropped it at Daytona. Oh no. And yeah, because somebody was messaging me about fixing it, and I guess they didn't like the price. So. Oh. Yeah. You know, I hate painting RT fairings. Yeah, I do too. Uh, they're they're so, and then, you know, they're just so big, and you're painting inside and out, and it's not like a bagger fairing or a, a, you know where you're painting one side of it. Right. So it's just always like hanging places. I got to have all these this foam everywhere in my yes. shop to set it down and i, I just fucking hate dealing yeah. with it they use a lot of material uh-huh so <laughs> yeah i'm doing one for uh josh mercenary motorcycle yeah yeah i'm getting ready to do his dining it's got a rt rp style fairing and uh, we're having issues with finding light pods that mold and fit the thing correctly you know mm-hmm. so it doesn't have a one inch gap around the pod but uh, yeah same thing with that it had so many pinholes and it was so much work just getting it prepped ready for paint it's yeah. just it's insane i i just i've tried to stay away from painting because we're so busy with the parts yeah, side i was gonna of ask it. you i haven't saw a lot of paint coming yeah out i haven't i haven't done much at all i've kind of been turning it down because we're just so busy the the parts just take up all of our time yeah. and uh I honestly enjoy it a little more as a break from painting because it is so labor intensive and I've yeah. done it for so many years and it's not good for your health, you know? Yeah, so 100%. I, uh, I just, I'm trying to work more toward parts and just, I'm doing, still doing a few for, you know, a few select people and some, my, some of my own stuff, but it's not something I really want to kind of keep it that way. You yeah. Know? I, I made a post. I've been kind of alluding at this for a long time, but you know, like I, Publicly on Instagram, when I put out, I, I have to say, like, I don't, I'm not taking any paint jobs anymore. Yeah. But I have enough people that I do work for that I don't necessarily need to add any more clients right now. Exactly. You know what I'm yeah. saying? Yeah. So I still want to paint. I still want to be a part of projects. But right. if I if I go put on Instagram right now, uh, hey, I'm taking a paint job, I'll get one. Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? And then I'll get 400 other people that are mad because I can't do theirs. Exactly. And it's... It's a bad, it's a good problem to have. Yeah. But, you know, like, like every day, like I, I've, I've painted probably 10 helmets. I've never posted pictures of in the last couple of months just because when I post a picture of a helmet paint job. Yeah. I have 400 people that want a helmet paint yeah. job. Yeah. And uh, then they get mad because I only do, I only do Simpsons. Like, oh, why won't you paint a show? And I'm like, man, because I can't keep up with the Simpson demand. Right. Like if I start doing everybody, all these other helmets and. I know how to take apart Simpsons and put them back together, uh-huh. and I have a relationship with that brand, and and it's just easy for me. And yeah, there's so many painters out there. If you don't want a Simpson, go get a helmet from somebody else. Right? You know yeah, there's only so much of you that can go around. Exactly. You know, and that's kind of what you got to tell yourself. And and uh, there's a lot of talented people out there, but yeah, it's uh, you can only do so much. It know? it feels good to be like. Like, I can imagine how Jeremy felt, Lucky Strike, being at Daytona this year at the hardcore show and just... Yeah, seeing his work everywhere. Seeing his work everywhere. That's that's a great feeling to have. Uh-huh. But I also think it's a great feeling to be that one guy that just has that one badass paint job that yeah. says it all. You uh-huh. know what I'm saying? And, and I think that as I get older and I start dabbling in all these other things that I want to do, I still want to paint because I don't ever want to lose the skill. Right. I want to keep it, you know, I want to keep myself up with it, up with the times and shit, but... You know, it's just uh, I'd rather do less work that means more. Yes, that's exactly. So. Yeah, that's kind of the way I am. I, I, I feel a lot more refreshed, I guess you would say, yeah. whenever I go to do a job because I'm not banging it out every single day and yeah. trying to get something done for a deadline or, you know, I have all these jobs backed up. It just took all the fun out of it, you know, yeah. and it kind of starts taking the creativity out of it for me. Uh, and I, I like kind of where I'm at now, you know, where I can pick and choose. And if it's something that I like, something that's my style, I'll take mm-hmm. it on. But, yeah, exactly. You know, 
if it's something that's Jace's style, go talk to Jace. Yeah, exactly. You know, I, I get that all the time. I used to get, I don't, not so much now, but you know, I used to get a lot of the people that wanted like your style flames in the in the panel kind uh-huh. of vibe, and I'd always just like that's Brad's thing. <laughs> so go fuck with Brad on that. Um, you know, it's not not that like anything I do you couldn't do or vice versa, right. but it's just one of those things where it's like, you know. I don't know. I, I, I like the fact that, you know, we were just talking about this before, how, you know, when I got into this stuff, I was looking at painters and trying to emulate their style to learn how to do that. Exactly. But you do that for 10 years and eventually you have all these tools in your belt and then you start putting them together in a unique way that becomes who you are. Yes. So, yeah. you know, we're always, I, I can say we're, we're all made up of all of our influences. Exactly. But, you know, you have to do it long enough to create your own style. Yes. You just don't have one out of the gate. Yeah. I mean, I guess you couldn't if you study, I don't know, that maybe you do, maybe you don't. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I see a lot of influences uh, of guys that, you know, and where their motivation came from. You yeah, know, yeah. I can kind of see that in a lot of guys painting. Mine, you know, it was always Pete Finland. He, yeah. Uh, he just, you know, back in the day i'd always see the stuff he was doing for west coast and i just loved his style you know and i wanted something like that and i couldn't afford it so i kind of started teaching myself and and that's where my influence was you know him along with many others but he was a big motivator that really pushed me into that you know Uh, yeah pizza he's a badass man i i i mistakenly never really looked at his work in the level that i should have until i actually sat down and did a podcast and had a conversation and really looked at his work and was like oh yeah that's yeah. why you're you know you're a legend in this right. industry yeah you know and uh you know he's uh he's always done just a he has a style of his own too man and and uh i don't know i like his uh he does some things that i would like to try but it, if i did it it would clearly be his thing right, right. you know yeah. what i mean so yeah. it's like i can't yeah. really pull it off and whatnot but and I'm sure you follow Massa, Center Roots, you know, oh, yeah. and all those guys. It's insane yeah, I, what they're doing. I like following them, but I also don't because <laughs> I know what you're gonna say. <laughs> I'm like, dude, you're you're raising the bar to another planet, man. Yes. We can't do that shit. I, I, I I'm blown away at some, and I've talked to him about some of the things, like back when I took the the, the class. pinstriping class. You know, I talked to him about some of that stuff, and he would explain to me how he did it, but I still couldn't do it. You know, it's just like. A lot of those guys out in, in Japan and Thailand and stuff that are doing that stuff, I almost feel like it, it's straight, like, they're painting stuff that's more going to sit on a shelf sometimes, yeah. it feels like. Yeah. Like the Kings guy. Uh-huh. and Like, I'm not saying that they don't ride it or anything like that. I'm sure they do. But there's something in my head. Just I feel like these are bikes that are kind of very delicate. Right. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Yeah. And, uh it's like that one Kings dude. He's like he's putting like a resin in the side of a dish tank. And yeah. It's like that's got to fall out, dude. Yeah. You ride around with two things that aren't like it's going to it's going to have creases on it come and, out. And it looks so deep, too, yeah, you yeah. know. You've got a shadow behind the emblem because it sets off exactly. the tank. It's wild. I mean, it is. You wild. remember back in the day when we were like everybody in a bagger wanted their lights f- frenched in uh-huh. with the paint. Right. And then as soon as it goes to get in the sun, it just sinks back and Yeah have the line ever it's like that's exactly what i think would happen if right. you blend a plastic and a metal together they're going to heat and contract at different rates uh-huh. and then it's going to cause a cause paint scene so, right right i don't know that's just me like hating yeah i don't know <laughs> i uh i I'm, i don't know if you've seen that tank that billy lane did back in the day where he had the little derringer pistol and i think it had cards and all kind of stuff that was sunk in the tank mm. and it had a clear resin over it mm. um uh, but uh, I, I, I don't think I could be wrong. I haven't seen that bike in years. I don't think it ever broke out, but it was like a epoxy resin, and I've used that stuff on my counter up there. You see it at a lot of Mexican restaurants oh, where yeah, they put yeah. the tile down, and they pour this stuff. It was called Envirolite back in the day, and you pour it in real thin layers, and I don't know if that's what he did or not, yeah. but uh, that stuff, it holds up really, really well. I actually did a tank where I sunk this silver dollar down in it that this guy wanted that was his dad's and he had passed away and uh, sunk it down in the tank and it just looks like it's floating in there and that's how i did it and yeah. it's been done for years and it hasn't cracked out oh that's good then yeah, yeah yeah so that may be what he's doing i don't know that but it's a possibility yeah that's that's what he's well, it makes doing. sense i just like i said i was just thinking you know from back in the day stuff and you know heat yeah and all that shit you know right. what I mean? but yeah, I don't know. I've seen a lot of, like, in the chopper world, a lot of dudes do that shit now where they'll, they'll oh, yeah. push in the top and they'll put, like, 
all weed, kind of weed, yeah, and fucking coke lines right. and dollars in it and shit. It's like, <laughs> yeah, I think that's the same stuff. Yeah, yeah that's cool. I, I, I like. I, I've wanted to do more chopper stuff. Honestly, um, I guess maybe because when you get a cool chopper tank or maybe a rear fender front fender, you're not overwhelmed like like when you have that whole bagger lane on yes. the floor. I mean, I have a whole bagger in my car. Yeah, my Jeep is full front to back in bagger parts. So uh. it's like. You know, fortunately, the way I do paint jobs, I, I you know, I, I rarely do anything on lids. You uh-huh. know, I, I, I kind of follow that traditional two-tone kind of vibe. Right. So a lot of parts end up going a solid color, but you'll still have 10 parts that need artwork on oh, it. Oh, yeah. And, uh, yeah, it's just it's And then big. laying it all out, making it look right on the bike, which I yeah. see you normally mock it up on the bike. And, yeah. Man, it's, it's just a lot of work. And I, I don't know, I just get drowned it out, and I just feel brought down lose all motivation i mean i just got to where i wouldn't even paint a bagger i was so busy with choppers and like you know fxr soft tails i wouldn't even touch a a bagger because it took up so much of my time Mm -hmm. and i had no time for anything else and then if you ran into a problem and had to start over or something messed up man it was just it was a nightmare yeah and i mean when you're layering paint jobs you have to clear coat multiple times so you have like a whole day of sanding and then you know then you do a couple things, then you got to lock that in, you know, for edge reasons. Yeah. And, and some things are just too delicate to go take back over and shit. Yeah. It's just a pain in the ass. Man. It is. Yeah. I've been getting away from flaking a lot lately. Really? Not not out of personal preference, but like as a challenge, like how do I make this non-flaked thing still pop? Yeah. You know what I mean? Like whether it's with pearls or other types of things to kind of give it some kind of jazz to it, but... Just like, I don't know, I got bored with another flank paint job, another another panel, another this, or even my own style I'm kind of bored with yeah. right now. You know I, I mean? I'm the same way. That That's like on this FXR. That's why I did it, plain and simple, mm-hmm. no flake. That FXR outside that I took to uh, Sturgis this year has no flake. It's all just pearl, black, and some yeah. candy red. And uh, it was the same thing. I've just done flake after flake after flake, and I'm just burnt out on it. You know, I wanted yeah. to do something different. I kind of started to feel like all my stuff was starting to look the same, you know, yeah. and I wanted to switch it up. So that's that's what I did, too. Same thing with, like, some of the tricks that I may do in the paint. Like, I'm getting to a point where I'm, like, tired of using them. Yep. Uh, but I, they're, they're requested, yeah. like, from the customer yeah. a lot. And so I'm like, fuck, man, like, Everybody's gonna think this is the only thing I know how to do. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Everybody likes those like broken shard looking things. Uh-huh. And I, Poland's the one that kind of probably inspired me to do it. Right. Um, but I see it really heavy in a lot of different race style helmet stuff that a lot of the painters in that, in that realm do. But I started doing it on bikes a couple of years ago, and it's like almost like I haven't done lace on a bike in two and a half years, three oh, years. Really? I haven't. And I don't, it's not that I don't like it or anything like that. I just haven't had a request for it. And then sometimes some dudes got weird about that like they didn't because they'll have flowers in it and yeah like, i don't want flowers yeah in it, right man. yeah and uh i'm like well what am i gonna do yeah man? yeah <laughs> but oh uh, speaking of poland that fxr that he painted for jimmy mm-hmm. at horsepower inc yeah. man i love that bike that yeah. when i saw that in daytona it was the the chrome paint yeah. you know it was it was just different you know yeah, that paint job came out real badass. I'm I'm excited because he's doing his own bagger right now. Uh huh. Um, he's been dragging his ass on it, but it's when it comes out, I think it's gonna be badass. Like seeing him such a such a helmet guy. Uh huh. Seeing him transition like every once in a while, like he's gonna look at a at a bike in different ways than me and you do. You know what I mean? Because uh-huh. right. we paint bikes more than, or I used to paint bikes more than I paint helmets. But so it, the canvas is different. So he yeah. might find different ways of throwing lines across it that we might not ever thought yeah. about, you know? Uh-huh. And sometimes that's all I need to see. Something different. Someone yeah. that threw a line that way, it works. Now I can I can design a whole new paint job, Yeah, my style, with that one line that yeah. I liked of someone else's, you know? And that's kind of like, I've been looking at a lot of these helmet painters that do motocross helmets and stuff like that just to try to get inspired to yeah. do something different, you know? It's, it's definitely fun, man. I've, uh, it, it's you, you add more like there's elements that I put in my traditional flake kind of style paint jobs now that I pulled from that world like, uh-huh. the, like the thin faded pinstripe lines that come in and out yeah those are yeah those they're so I mean they're they're kind of a pain in the ass to do sometimes there's a lot of taping for such a small thing uh-huh but it really does jazz things up it does you know what I mean yeah so same thing like when I, I had I built my t-sport this year I wanted something simple, but I wanted to create some kind of flow between the fairing, the tank, and stuff like that. And 
you know, I didn't flake it out, but I did use like ice pearl. Uh-huh. Uh, I like using those from like House of Color and stuff, and uh, loved it, man. I used a used a paint huffer like purple uh, grape ape, I think is what yeah. they call it, and it's one of my favorite pearls. And I you put it over either like a like a purple base, like a like a House of Color passion pearl or something, uh-huh. or you could put it over black and it makes purple. Right, and it's just such a beautiful color, man. Huh. So yeah, I, I did my T sports like that this year, and was trying to do something simple and different and whatnot. And I don't know. I feel like I'm in a I'm in a style transition phase right now. Yeah, I kind of feel the same way. <laughs> I'm right there with you. Like I said, the last few bikes I've done for myself, none of them had to flake or you know it's kind of been centered around the death metal racing logo and just yeah. not real real flashy paint. Just kind of trying to but draw more emphasis on the bike. I, I guess. feel like it's time though. I mean, if you yeah. think about like the Obviously, the panel stuff has been around for ages, but it really came back heavy, like 10, 11, 12, yeah. and it's been going strong since. Yes. Right? So I feel like right now we're in a in a transitional phase as a, as the whole paint industry yeah. into, like, newer style stuff. I mean, nobody airbrushes anymore no. on anything, you know? Like, mm-hmm. I'm really, that's the one thing that I'm like, I'm like, it's something I tried so hard to be good at. And you are. I mean, and then, like, it's just not it's not applicable nobody really uses it nobody uh-huh. nobody other than like a helmet here and there that will want a face on it i haven't picked up an airbrush since april really so for me well i haven't picked an airbrush to do i've yeah. drop shadows and shit like that but so for me like now if someone wants me to do a face i'm like fuck i haven't done this in a long time like can i still do it like <laughs> i have all this anxiety going into it that yeah. i'm like fuck man like i don't like that you yeah. know because i don't know if i'm gonna pull this off right or not right you know? right and uh but I've been wanting, I got some ideas that when I used to do a lot of big wheel stuff, I would do a lot of monochromatic airbrush kind of like in the paint where uh-huh. it's like, say you had a white and then you did a, like an off gray or light gray airbrush over it. So it was real subtle, kind of like Corey St. Clair used to do yes. a lot of that stuff. Uh-huh. I want to get back to doing more of that. Yeah. Just to try to stay relevant or just keep the airbrush muscle alive. Because yeah. right now it's a fucking, I don't want to do it at all, you know? <laughs> Which me. <laughs> I understand. I understand. Yeah. So how is, uh. Yeah, it's a good thing to be able to step back from paint and uh, and focus on other aspects of the business and stuff. And Yeah, like I said, I relied on it so heavily for so many years. It was a big part of my business and, you know, pumping that stuff out to pay the bills. And uh, it just, uh, I, I was just ready for a break, you know. Mm-hmm. And uh, with this industry, anything you do, you do it long enough, you're going to get burnt out on mm-hmm. it, you know. And uh even with the parts, you know, you think, I've got to come up with a new idea. I've got to come up with a new design. I need to get parts out for this. It's always something. And uh, it's just nice to be able to kind of step back away from one thing, go over to another area, maybe build a bike or whatever, and and uh, kind of re-energize. Yeah, yeah. I know what you mean on that. It's uh, when I go on a bike trip, I come back ready to work and uh-huh. ready to get in it. But it still takes me like a week or so to get back into the groove of working, but my enthusiasm is there to do yeah. it. You know what I mean? And I, I was actually talking to Poland about this earlier this year. And, uh, cause like, how many helmets did you paint last year? And he goes, uh, about 87 or 88 of them. Jeez. And I'm like, fuck man. Like I did 39 last year. And this year I probably have, I will probably have only done maybe 30, but it's like, I travel so much. And then, yeah. and then like you get, like I said, it's like, yeah, I'm home, but it takes me a week to get back into the groove of working. Right. I'll go to the shop and sweep it every day just to like, where you at, man? Come on, let's let's yeah. get the let's get the motivation to start right. doing this job and and then bam, I gotta go out of town again, you know. Yeah. A week later. So it's like fuck. Yeah, it's kinda hard to be stay you know, stay in the flow of that. I, yeah. I see that. It's tough, man. You know. I was on the road for a whole month in June riding. Then I come home uh for four or five days and then i go to covington's for 10 days to work and when i'm there i've I've, something lights a fire under my ass and i just get shit done right but i have no distractions while i'm there yeah no no wife no kids no friends going to bars at night like it's just go to work get off go home go to sleep wake up and go back to work and then you know i painted did all the artwork on three baggers yeah in 10 days wow holy cow (laughs) That's nuts, and they're killing it, man. I saw some of their stuff in Sturgis, and it's just like my buddy James Carter, you know, <clears throat> he does a lot of their seats, and he talks to those guys all the time, and it's just nuts at how many bikes they yeah. sell every year at Sturgis. They just took 18 bikes this year to Sturgis and sold all of them. That's crazy. And I think they sold a car or two. 
Wow. Because, you know, Jerry's out there building hot rods and shit, too. Yeah. And they'll take a hot rod on trade for a bagger. Mm-hmm. And then he'll sell that to some. He's a willing and dealing motherfucker. Yeah, man. he is. He <laughs> sure is. They build some nice stuff. Yeah, I mean, you know, Dave out there is busting his ass and, and uh, making a lot of parts. And he he's, like, talk about having the practice. Like, how many years he's been in there grinding, making shit happen there. The dude just, he's just full of ideas. And, yeah. you know, he, he gets the opportunity to try it on on 18 bikes before right. Sturgis. Yeah. So, I don't know, it's wild. Yeah. How long have those guys been in business? It's Covington's? Yeah. Uh, Mid-90s, I believe. Yeah, I knew it had been a pretty good while. Wow. I did a podcast with him and with Jerry and Kathleen. And uh, they, the whole, like, how they met and how they started that moved you know from california to uh-huh. oklahoma started that place and you know and all the wild shit from the the mid, the mid 2000s with the biker build off stuff yeah. and yeah i mean they've he just like jerry just gets the business side of it which a lot of people in our industry they might be great wrenches or great idea people designers yeah. but the business side of things the selling the 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 the, the willing and dealing that's that's another feature of like as a business person, you got to yeah. be, you know what I'm saying? And some mm-hmm. of us aren't that great at it. That's right. You know? Yeah. So, yeah. I don't know. It's a weird one with those guys. But they, they, they're killing it, man. They are. They definitely are. He's uh, They're finally going to do a, a, I think, a legit performance bagger without, like, the fat tire front, front oh, end. Oh, yeah? I think they're going to be cool. Something. See? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, what their take on that is. Yeah, and, the, you know, they got – their hardest part is, like, they have all the CNC machines. They have everything on site to do – everything uh-huh. but they can't find workers yeah that's a problem everywhere i pretty much give up on that myself for real yeah like having a tech in here we don't we do very little like service work yeah of any type anymore i mean every once in a while if it gets slow we may but it's it's hardly ever slow anymore you yeah. know with the parts but uh yeah that's a big problem everywhere you know our the people we use for polishing the people we use for anodizing they all same story you know we don't have enough workers we can't get stuff done quick enough you know it's just i don't i I guess i don't understand how like if there's jobs available how are people surviving without working we have this conversation almost on a weekly basis i i will go to restaurants and they don't have they they've got the lobby closed because they don't have anybody to serve that's just a drive-through i'm like how are these there's so many people that are unemployed sitting at home how are they making it you know is the government giving them a check what what's going on because i've never seen this many places needing help you know you everywhere you go there's help wanted signs they don't have enough workers i'm like how are people making it gas prices are sky high everything's going up you know how how do they make it yeah and the, the the scariest part about it too is like even if like every business raised what they would pay somebody, it would fuck. It, it would just like raising gas prices. Yeah. it just you know. I mean, it, it just gets passed on to the consumer. No, no matter how you look at it, you know, it's now you go to McDonald's and it's a twenty dollar. It's a twenty. I mean, I already flip out on the fact that like fast food used to be like a five dollar meal. Remember, yeah. remember five dollar footlongs from. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. not a thing no more. No. Like, uh-uh. Surely the bread isn't that much more expensive. Right. So. We went to uh, McDonald's, my wife and I, a few weeks ago and got a bite to eat real quick. And it was a quarter pounder. And, you know, a quarter pounder is supposed to be a quarter pound hamburger. Mm-hmm. And now they've made the patties smaller. They made the buns smaller. They're almost the size of like their regular cheeseburger now. Mm-hmm. And it all due to the inflation, you know, instead of raising the prices up, they shrunk the burger, you know. <laughs> so it's kind of false advertisement. It's not yeah. a quarter pound hamburger anymore. Formerly known as quarter pound. Right, exactly. <laughs> Yeah, it's weird because, you know, I, I guess like in a similar vein, like you're kind of off the beaten path from a major yeah. city, the same way that Covington's is. They're way up there in almost a panhandle of Oklahoma. So, the 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 pool of uh, applicable um, employees is definitely not. Yeah, and they they need like CNC program writers and yeah. things like that. You know, which you're not gonna find that in an oil field right. town in the middle of nowhere. Yeah, <laughs> and yeah. you're probably not gonna get one of those guys want to move there either. Right. So right. you know that's yeah, probably the hard part. Pretty much the same situation we're in here. Yeah. yeah. But it is nice because, you know, you don't have all the distractions. You know, uh, you don't have if somebody's coming here, they're coming to buy something or they need something. It's not yeah. you know, you know a bunch kickers. of people coming to hang out and shoot the bull and talk about yeah. building this fifty thousand dollar bike. You know that they've had dreams of for 
30 years and never really have any interest of doing you know yeah. when we were in dyersburg that was a big thing we had so many people that would come in just to talk and you couldn't get anything done mm. you know so now we don't really have that problem anymore you still live down there though right like no we live this is where i grew up oh yeah. for real yeah yeah where i'm was, a quarter uh, of a mile from here is that the same house yeah that, okay mm -hmm. i, I I guess I got turned around when we were here last time. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I was like, fuck. Because I know we rode, when me and my brother left, we rode up around, like, I guess, land between two lakes or some shit. Okay. Up yeah. on the board. There's Real Foot Lake, and then, yeah, there's yeah, we LBL. Yeah. Yeah, a little farther up. Yeah. Oh, that's beautiful out here, man. Uh, yeah. Yeah. But yeah, that's. Um, I don't know. Last time I came through here it was a it was a wild one. Yeah. The next day. <laughs> yeah. no, no, did they ever find that bike that got they, stolen? They ended up finding the bike uh, like a year later, and it was like two miles away in a, in a storage unit. But it was just a frame. Really? Yeah. Frame and like a uh, transmission. Holy cow! Yeah. But yeah, I didn't know. I didn't know it was that gangster over there that's, in uh, Indianapolis. Yeah, that's pretty crazy. Yeah, it was a wild one. Yeah. But yeah, people. I, I mean, yeah, it's weird. That's all. Like tonight, I'm like hoping that when I get to Tennessee, like my Cadillac converter doesn't get jacked or some shit. Yeah, like, yeah. Make sure it wasn't you, as the, you were the bad luck. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully, that's not the case. Yeah. yeah. Man, I've, there, we have this uh, on Instagram. We have this uh, thing in Dallas called Dallas Texas TV, mm -hmm. and it's just like user submitted news based on everything going on in Dallas. So there's lots of people sending stories, right. tagging them, and they'll repost it. And there's just like people like these. If you have lifted vehicles in Texas, you're fucked. People they'll go while you're in the in like a grocery store, or Walmart. They'll pull up, jump under there, roll into your car real quick, and fucking cut Are that you thing. Serious? It's so bad. It's insane. Wow. My, my my buddy Saxon, he used to work for me. He moved to Salt Lake, and they they got his ass. He's got a lifted like a Toyota uh, Tundra or some shit like that. That's crazy, man. This world is nuts. Dude, me and my wife were, you know, we were having this conversation like people are like losing mindfulness. Oh, yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Like just manners and just like, yes, when you're in public places, people just they don't know how to act in public places anymore. Yeah. Know? Yeah. We uh, we were talking about that ourselves. It's it's I don't know, man. I don't know what the world's coming to. You're being further out of the city like like this is kind of the move. Yeah. Oh, definitely. You know? Yeah. No doubt. <laughs> No doubt. I'm fortunate that, like, uh, we used to live in downtown, like, Dallas. And I used to love it down there. I loved being just so social and everything. Uh -huh. But then we moved out to the, like, past the suburb suburbs right before it becomes, like, legit country. Yeah. And, uh, man, it's just, it's not, we don't have the amenities that we had before. As many places to go, eat, shop, things like that. But when all the shit kicked off a couple of years ago and we were out of town, it was awesome. Yeah. You know, it took a long time for, for COVID affected our County. Yeah. You yeah. That's I mean? the same here. It never really shut down. Yeah. You know, the state might've passed some kind of, you know, mandate or whatever, but yeah. there was never, we were working every single day, yeah. you know, everything just normal. Now, if you want to go somewhere to eat, you know, you might not can go in, mm -hmm. but, uh, but yeah, for the most part, it was, it was pretty normal. Yeah. But, uh, I don't know, man. I, I saw on the news last night where they were talking about how, and this is how messed up it is. You know, you got all the killings and stuff that go on in Memphis and all that craziness that's happened the last few weeks. And, mm -hmm. you know, one of the guys, he had just got out of prison. Uh, he served 11 months on a, well, he was originally convicted of first degree murder, or maybe it was attempted first degree murder, but he pled to a lesser charge of aggravated assault. Mm -hmm. And he was out in 11 months. And then a year later, he goes on the shooting spree down there. Mm. Well, uh, you know, it's just, I don't understand how it gets to that point. You know, how, why are we letting people out? I didn't mean to get all political. Oh, and no, no, I understand. This crazy that. stuff. But it's just, I, I don't understand. You know, well, my point was what I was getting at. I saw on the news where there was car shops that were being raided by the epa for yeah. uh, changing exhaust you know Tuners, doing deletes yeah. uh, you know doing a delete on a diesel now you'll get a year in prison for real? you know well, you'll get more time and they've got they've got people on the internet search i've got a friend that he owns automotive business and he he told me about how serious it is you know you get caught deleting a diesel and uh 
you'll get more time for doing something like that mm -hmm. than you will out here killing somebody you know that's, that's that's the thing this dude was in prison for 11 months and somebody goes and changes an exhaust system on a car and they'll get Mandatory more time year. yeah more time than this guy that just shot and killed somebody man i don't i don't understand like i understand it's about the climate and shit like that but at the same time it's like they, there's so much industry that they'll kill. So many people yeah. rely on the, the sales of, of modified exhaust systems, work in the manufacturers to make, like, you're going to, I mean, you're not going to kill as many people on, out of work as, like, if the trucking industry went to electric, yeah. you know? Uh, there's towns built around yeah. diesel gas stations yeah. on the road, right? But there's going to be a lot of people out of work. and I mean, every little small shop, all these dealers, all you know, your summit racing, those kind of places, yeah. like that, a lot of that shit goes away, and it's already, like, it's already feeling weird when you got California kind of pushing these, like, no, the banning the gas powered yeah. car sales by in five years or seven yeah. years, I think yeah. is what they're twenty thirty five is when yeah. it's all electric, yeah. And it's like that's not realistic. No, no, they can't even keep up the grid. You know, it's yeah. like they're rolling blackouts, and I, I just, I don't know, man. It's, yeah, it's a. Uh, you know, uh, and even in the motorcycle industry, you know, you can't sell an exhaust to somebody in California. Yeah. You know, you will get fined. I know, you know, big company in the motorcycle world that was fined a ton of money because they sold an exhaust system, you know, got shipped to California. Yeah. Like I said, you get in more trouble for that than you are out yeah. here killing somebody, man. It's nuts. It's, everything's backwards. Yeah, that's a, I mean, I guess it kind of goes to the whole concept of, uh, you know, the 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 police patrol the middle class neighborhoods more yeah. than, than the poor or the upper class because the upper class has the money to fight. Yeah. The lower class has no money to pay it. Yeah. The middle class doesn't have enough to fight it and they can't afford not to pay it. Right. You know what I'm saying? Yep. So it's like they end up getting snuffed out and that's kind of the same thing. It's like, it you know, all these uh, new laws and mandates, it's just kind of to keep, I feel like it's just like these social things that... that, that government does to kind of keep people in classes more exactly you know what yeah. i'm saying yeah because every time you you find a new way to to make money and come up like yes they find a way to kind of okay we can't have that many people growing yeah you know yep you gotta it's like the dot-com thing when that shit popped off and mm -hmm. then everybody was making money and then just, yeah i don't think it just went away for its own i feel like rules got put into place and shit started happening yeah. And then, yeah, it went away. I mean, that's that's the thing. You take away a lot of these regulations and you see stuff grow, you know, when it starts getting somewhere. And all of a sudden somebody comes in, new politicians, and changes it all again, you know. Well, that's also the reason why, like, a lot of people were leaving California and moving to Tennessee and Texas and yeah. stuff. Because you could build shit here. Yeah. You know what I mean? You can come here and you don't have to go through so much bureau bureaucracy to open a business or to build something, a build right. a house and stuff, stuff like that. Yeah, so. and, and it's crazy just 20 minutes down the road. And that's why I moved here where I was before. Everything, you had to go through so much more bull, which is no nowhere near, you know, like California or something like that. Yeah. But it's a huge difference from there to here as to what you have to do and what you, the regulations or the taxes or anything, you know, just right down the road. And that, I, I couldn't imagine. I couldn't imagine trying to run a business in California or somewhere yeah. like that, man. It's just so many restrictions and so expensive. And it just seems like everything's working against you, you yeah, know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's like there's nothing there to help you at right, all. Right, yeah, right. That makes sense 100%. So how has, uh, how has everything been? Like, I mean, you Daytona, you know, all the events you've done this year, has it just been normal or? You know... I would say our sales have been really, really good, and we've gotten a lot of response. And, you know, with the economy, I kind of – I was worried, thinking everything was going to start slowing down and, and tank. But uh, that wasn't really the case. It was we, – we did really good at every event, you know, and it seems like everybody else did. But uh, now I am starting to see a little bit of slowdown, you know, and, you know, I don't know if it's just because of the news and – them talking about a recession and we're in a recession and people are just kind of like holding yeah. back but uh and it is kind of a bad time of the year you know right now it, things slow down anyway yeah, until say that, you know yeah. thanksgiving black friday we always have you know good week that week but uh it is kind of a 
a slow time yeah but uh it seems a little unusually slow i guess you'd say i've always felt like late august september and and october is kind of like the uh it's the recovery from the push to Sturgis yes. or the builds for Sturgis and all yeah. that. And then everybody's just kind of like, oh. And the kids are going back yeah. to school, you know, yeah. we got to buy school clothes. You got to do this. And you got Christmas that. coming up and yep. family shit. But, you know, honestly, it's like, if you think about it, like things like having Daytona and this and that, like they're kind of in a good spot because it does like a shop like yours, a guy's going to want to do a Daytona build probably now. Yeah. He's going to start now or start ordering parts, you yeah. know? Yeah people listening out there that's now is when you start yes and this is even kind of late for some shops but don't wait till fucking february to say i want to get my bike painted right and i want to get this and that and yeah right now the way supply is you better start ordering parts now for daytona in march not bike toberfest but march you better start ordering parts that's fucking wild man yeah yeah, I'm uh, so What do you think about uh, the Born Free coming to Texas? You think about I think, coming down? Yeah, we're setting up at that. Oh, I'm, yeah. I'm kind of excited. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm looking forward to that. I hope it turns out to be a big deal. I yeah. do, too. Uh, you know, I I spent Monday, I was on the phone with the, the dude, Mike, one of the owners of it, uh-huh. for about an hour and a half, and he really answered a lot of questions I had about it and concerns I had, and I'm, I'm stoked now. Because, really? I mean, we're going to have a booth set up. Uh, I've been getting a lot of the homies helping them get in. You know what I'm saying? Right. Like get boost because they kind of cut off the uh, the uh, the entry to yeah. get in. But it's just out there is cool, but there's nothing there. Really? Right? There's no like, there's not a lot around it. Right. So it's like when you go to Born Free in California, yeah. like, oh, let's go stay, let's go to Laguna Beach and have have dinner tonight. Yeah. You ain't doing that out there. Really? <laughs> yeah. How far is it from Dallas? Uh, so from Dallas, it is about, it's about two hours. Really? Yeah. East of Dallas. Dallas. Uh, yeah. So. It's east of us, so it's by Tyler, Texas. Okay. So not too far from that, but we're actually hosting a uh, a pre party in at Strokers. In, oh, really? In Dallas on that Thursday. Thursday. Okay. So we have uh, you know like FXR Division, uh, Speed Kings. A lot of those companies are going to be coming to town, and we're all going to kind of mob. You know, we talked to Rick and and uh, lean up there at Strokers, and we're going to use their place as the oh cool as a jump off for all the performance style bike uh huh you know stuff because. They have a pre-party they're doing in Nacogdoches, but uh-huh. it's kind of more the chopper guys, and it's not a big event, and there's nothing there. Right. It's a, it's a small town, you know, so I don't know. Yeah, Let's I'll see. have to hit that up, but yeah, we're, we're setting up at that, so I'm, I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, it's, it's going to be fun, man. I'm, I'm excited. I wasn't at first. I, was, I, I had a little bit of a, a little bit of a Texas pride in me, like all these Californians coming to Texas, and now they're bringing their own <laughs> fucking show. And we got to go be spectators in our own backyard. Right. Like, that's how I felt, you know. And it's just it was a it was a silly emotion, but at the same time, it's like, you know, I, I, I told Mike, I was like, look, I want you guys to know that we have a scene, uh-huh. like a, a scene worth having its own, right? Thing. Not like, like we need we don't need California to be, yeah. you know, like we you know our camp out we get we get a lot of people at that. Yeah, thing. yeah. I saw you know what I'm saying? pictures so, and stuff. No people that went. Yeah. Yeah. So totally. it's like you know we we have events out here. You know. Like, there's more motorcycling on the, the – I feel like when you're in California, you kind of have blinders onto the rest of the country. Right. Which is rightfully so. It's amazing out yeah. there for motorcycling. But, you know, hey, like, we didn't just get bikes last week. Yeah, <laughs> you know exactly. Uh, but, no. I miss Giddy Up. I, I've been talking about it a lot. But Giddy Up used to be uh, just a fucking amazing show. Really? It was big enough to be beneficial to set up a booth, but it was small enough that you felt like you can – really get to know people and have a good time and yeah. not, not be overwhelmed. You know yeah. what I'm saying? So yeah. Sturges, Sturges can be overwhelming. Yeah, it can. Uh, born Free, you know, did you go this year? I didn't go there. I haven't been Born Free since COVID. Like, ever since so you, all that craziness happened, yeah. I really don't care to be in California, <laughs> you know, because I'm so anti uh, all that BS. You know, yeah. I just... I, I believe in being free, I guess you'd say. Yeah. I don't know. I'm Real not American. into lockdowns and masks and all that stuff. Not trying to get political again, but yeah. I just, I'm not into it. And uh, I don't know. I saw confrontations that were happening out there online. You know, you go out there and I'm not going to conform and, you know, do that stuff. So I yeah. just kind of stayed away from it. But I used to go to it, you know, years ago. I've been yeah. been to it and I always really liked the show. And I would, it was just as much of a bike show in the parking lot as it was, yeah. you know, inside the show. For sure. And we would just walk everywhere. 
Yeah, I, I saw you there in 19. Yeah. That was the last time I went, too, other than this year. But, man, I don't know. It's like every year that I go back, I have more fun. But I, I realize it's because I know more people. Yeah. And it's like, oh, shit. You know, it just becomes a, a, a better – like, I don't feel like I'm a spectator of it anymore. Right. You know, right. sometimes – I guess it's my ego. Sometimes I just, you know, I want to be there and be a part of it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, I get um, it. And, you know, like I, I, I had my bike in the Bassani booth for one day, and then I had it in the Simpson oh, booth cool. the next day. So it was like, it was cool to be able to do that, and then have people come and find us and talk yeah, to us. Yeah, it's an honor, shit, shit. you know, yeah. and say your stuff in those 100%. places. Yeah. So yeah, this is so I'm setting up a booth for Born Free. It's gonna be the first time I've set up a booth in. I don't know, eight years. Really? I don't. I don't. I don't really have anything to sell. Uh-huh. So. Um, but I think we're going to do some t-shirts for Born Free Texas that are yeah. like only be for sale there. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't, like I said, I don't really have anything to sell. So it's like, I don't, I don't sell parts. I, I all I do is sell helmets that are painted. So it's like, I'm not gonna, Yeah. and I don't, I'm not taking in any helmets right now. So it's like, right. I guess we're just drinking in our booth. Yeah. You need to be there. Yeah. That's like I said, that's in your backyard. Yeah. So yeah, you definitely need to be there. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm. Like I said, I got some plans that I'm going to try to make happen over the next couple of years that'll. I haven't seen it. I mean, definitely seen things that lo- of it, of its nature be done before, but you know, with having a podcast and and all these different areas of of my brand, it's like it's very unique in the sense. Like, uh, I I don't know anybody else that has that. It's a I know a lot of people that have podcasts, but I don't know anybody that has a podcast with a business that all kind of goes together, yeah. and works and and whatnot. So. I don't know. Should be unique. Yeah. I was trying to do like more online stuff earlier, but I just I, I'm not good with customer service. Really? Like I'm not. I'm I'm short. I can be short with people. You uh-huh. know, it's like I'm, I'm not proud of this, but I just can't deal with people. Like I, I like I'm a Simpson dealer, but I don't tell people I sell helmets because I don't want to deal with dudes that don't know how yeah. their sizes are. Yeah and complain and like this, this helmet's noisy man i'm like well then drive your fucking car right you know what i mean <laughs> it's like, I, I know what you mean man we it's same way in the parts business you know we'll we'll get guys and i, I think that's kind of our biggest asset is our customer service but it is it tries your patience because you know you, you'll get guys that uh they'll order a set of risers and i'm not this this happens pretty regular i'm not talking about one specific person or anything yeah. but you know they'll order a set of risers and they'll get them in they'll bolt them on their bike well this isn't as tall as what i can do, do you take those back can i exchange it's like no man you can't mount the parts on your bike and try them out and see you know it's, yeah. it's not the right height for you and just send them back and us resell them you know but yeah we we get a lot of crazy crazy requests in the parts business or people that what kills me the most and this is on Instagram or on the website. Read the description. Dude, I cannot tell you how many that they will order the wrong part just because they don't read the description. Yeah. They just look at the picture and click on the part and buy it. You know, yeah. you got to read to see what mounts you need or what fits what. Yeah. So many people, they're used to Amazon and just, just one click. And, you know, yeah. they yeah. do not read the fitment. So many guys have bought the the m8 soft tail clevises it clearly says m8 soft tail clevis and they'll have an m8 bagger you know and they're putting pegs on the back of it and they'll order m8 clevises you know m8 yeah. soft tail clevises and they'll get it well this won't fit it's like you know you got to read the description it tells you you know what what you got to have for what bike but it's uh it's it's something we have to deal with you know yeah like i said the, the patient side of it like right just just taking a breath and going okay so sir this is what you got to do and you try to be nice and you try to be helpful and you know like i just don't have that yeah you know what i mean I, yeah I, I i like you know when you when i paint i i, I try to i try to like uh when it's time to work on your project me and you are going to talk a lot uh-huh. until then we don't have anything to talk about. right right i don't want to talk to you every day okay. texting me like hey man what do you think about this color i'm like cool save all these ideas until we start your yes. project yes you know and and I, I guess I'm just like a hyper focus kind of guy, and I hyper focus on one project, and and then when I'm on that project, I need to be in contact with that customer. Yeah. And so then I guess I probably have better customer service because I can hyper focus on their job. Yes. But, um, 
But yeah, the other thing that, you know, like what you were just saying where people don't read stuff, it's like the same thing when you post pictures online and Oh yeah. God damn dude. Yeah, I I'll reshare customers that have bought our parts and put them on their bikes and I'll repost it. First thing I get is, Hey, this guy has this, you know, particular part, you know, where can I get that on your website or or uh at what what pipe or what exhaust is on that bike or you know something about the bike that is not ours you know yeah. and they want to know all this details and stuff about it it's like you know or this bike you built what what pipe is this or what you know whatever the the yeah. part may be it's like you know you just ask the customer there his name i, I don't know yeah. that answer i don't have that answer but geez they never ever read ever it just looks at the picture and first thing or you tell them you know, this is coming out next month, sneak peek. Very th next thing in the inbox is like, how much are those? I'm ready to order one. You know, I was like, yeah. well, it's not ready yet. You know, it's just, yeah. Well, the Internet's opened up. I mean, for you can attest to this, like, you know, from building bikes and, and, and whatnot. You've always kind of had a nationwide kind of a, a presence uh -huh. even before I would say like Instagram started blowing up. I mean, right. you built bikes for people and things like that and painted. But it's amazing how like you can use that now oh yeah and sell parts all over the country or world for that matter yes and and like with a simple like i'm gonna post a picture of this and then tomorrow no matter what somebody's gonna buy that product or a or hundred of them you know right. what i'm saying yeah that's, yeah that's awesome but it's i don't know does it seem real all the yeah. time yeah i know you know yeah it's uh it's definitely, like I said, it changed our whole business dynamic. You know, it's it's totally changed my business, you know. Was there like a point in time where you felt like, because you were so, like you said, you were painting and you're building bikes and all this shit. And when it changes and like you don't have to do that anymore for a living, do you feel like there's like this kind of, like, I don't know if I want to give this up or stop doing this as much because this new income is here and this new thing that's also needs my attention. Yeah. You know, like you're cheating on yourself or something like yeah, that. Yeah, you do. And also you kind of, you worry like, well, I'm going over here to this and what if this crashes and you know, I, I still need to be doing a little bit of this, you know? So it's, it's, yeah, there's always that worry that it, it doesn't seem real and it's not yeah. going to last. I mean, but, uh, I always just try to, stay working no matter yeah. what it is that's kind of my whole thing keeps my keeps me sane and yeah, it's like yeah. i'm always working mm -hmm. you know if i'm down about something or you know i'm in a rut i'll change gears and go work on my old truck out in the shop you know yeah. but i just i can't sit still and do nothing you know <laughs> i've got to be busy no that makes sense i just i i, I asked that question because i'm i kind of deal with that with this podcast and uh and pain and even whenever i used to wrench a little bit on bikes it's like as this thing grows and this is something i love doing and i do more of this it's like i feel myself getting further and further away from these other things that really made me who i who yeah. i am yeah. you know and uh you know and then there's also this point where like as i'm not producing more in there in the world i'm less of a player in that game too right so as i'm doing more podcast stuff and painting less i'm less of a painter in the public eye yeah and i'm like you know, I even asked, I asked a friend this, the uh, Dave Covington. I was like, man, I was, I was complaining. It's like, people only think of me as a painter. And he goes, ah, a lot of people think of you as a podcast guy now. Uh -huh. and I was like, what, really? He's like, yeah, a lot of people do. And I'm like, well, fuck, I guess I'll go fuck myself then. <laughs> yeah. I think what it is, we get so focused on what we're doing because yeah. we do it day in, day out that you kind of, that's how you see yourself. You're not yeah. really thinking of how everybody else sees you and how they know you and so on and so on but yeah uh i i've kind of i've been guilty of that you know yeah. feeling the same way yeah but i don't know man just keep doing you, you yeah know? yeah for sure i mean like i said over the years i mean the, even the choppers that you've built you know have been some some of my favorite and like just Thank to you. have that skill alone yeah and almost like but like this like there, there's hundreds of people that w would love to be in your shoes in the building aspect to, to be able to do that. And then there's another hundred people that want to be able to be the, the painter that you are. Mm -hmm. And then you got like this whole parts business. And then there's, so there's like, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, it's just, I don't know, man. It's like, it's all just hard work. You know, yeah, yeah. it's nothing special. That's, there's no, 
I don't feel I'm any more talented than anybody else. Just I work yeah. hard. And, you know, the more people that you – not that I, I'm nowhere near wealthy or anything like that, but uh, – I'm not scrapping day to day, you know, robbing Peter yeah. to pay Paul like I did for so many years. But, uh, uh, but people that are successful, a lot of them, if you really follow them and see how they do it, it just all boils down. It's not, I mean, yeah, there's talent, there's stuff like that, but ultimately it boils down to hard work, yeah. you know, and putting in the hours. Yeah. And the multiple revenue streams too yeah. is another thing that helps out a lot of people. And I guess, you know when you do when you're good at one thing and it opens up doors that yeah you can also do these other things that are kind of align with it right. i mean it makes sense for you to be a bike builder and then to also take on the paint as you said earlier just because you couldn't yeah you know, at the time you couldn't afford to go have pete finland do right it. and the same thing with the parts it's like well as you're building bikes and you're fabricating the next thing you know they're like i got an idea for this yeah you know and yeah. so bam then it, it spawns this other other thing that now can you know like i said it starts to dwarf <laughs> Yeah. what you started doing yeah know? yeah and i always look at it too as if you know the economy crashes and this falls off i've got some other stuff to fall back on you yeah. know and i'm not just so driven to you know i'm not just uh pigeonholed into doing one thing yeah, you know yeah i can kind of if i need to go back to working on bikes i'm not too good for it i can change oil you know yeah. change tires whatever i've got to do to make ends meet but uh yeah it's just kind of i think everybody you do something for so long, you need a change. You get burnt out on it. You know, you've mm -hmm. got to kind of diversify and keep everything fresh. You yeah, know? 100 percent on that. Yeah, I've been I've been wanting I've been thinking about like, you know, air quotes, building another bike because I haven't done a frame off. I mean, I kind of did it on my T Sport this year, but it was kind of a thrown together bike. Yeah. The last bike I really did was my gold bike uh -huh. and uh, my FXR and. I've been wanting to do a bagger, but kind of like what you were just saying earlier, it's like, fuck, man, like it's, so, it's a lot of parts. And, yeah. and then it's like, I, I use my bagger so much that I don't know if it would really benefit me to, to do the, a wild build on that versus like maybe one of these other projects that I've been wanting to do, like the FXR chopper or something like that. It would yeah. probably make more sense to what I, the, the, the itch I need to scratch. I think one of those projects would fit it better yeah. than a bagger. So, right, right. But I do, I want to build something like, you know, I've, I've been hanging out and doing podcasts with all these people making badass shit. And it's like, I felt like it's been a long time since I did something like that. And it, being inspired by everybody it just makes me want to kind of get back into that a little bit. Not necessarily for customers, but for myself. Right, you know what I mean? right. Yeah, so, yeah, I get that. I get when that. you, when you, so you're still building bikes for people, right? Yeah, I've got okay. one, this Dominator that's over on the lift right now. I'm building that for a customer up in Washington, D.C. He's actually in the Secret Service and I've done a makeover on another west coast chopper mm. that he did or he had but um that's one i'm doing right now and uh, i really don't have anything scheduled behind that uh, other than just some personal builds you yeah. know uh, do you find but, it like better like do you enjoy building for yourself more than possibly customers just yeah because i kind of do it my way i mean i i used to really really like doing that kind of stuff like the west mm. coast stuff but it's to me now it, it just seems i've done it so much and there's so many of those out there i really dig the style still love the look of the bikes yeah um but i just i like doing stuff more of what i'm into not that yeah. i'm not into that but like i said i just did it for so long and i did yeah. so many of those things uh but it is kind of neat to do a dominator it's not just another cfl you know and it's got a lot of cool stuff on it but uh yeah i do I, I enjoy doing the ones for myself because i just do everything my way you know yeah that's what i'm finding too uh is that you know because when someone likes your style your bikes or they want to buy one or they decide like i want you to build me a bike because i love everything you do but then a lot i hear horror stories of people like builders that are like man this guy came in and he he wanted this and this and this and next thing you know it's like i'm not building a bike for him i'm assembling right all these parts he bought on amazon or yeah he bought online while he was bored one day right and so now like i don't have a say in this build i don't have a none of my vision or style is in it i'm just i'm just the assembler now yeah yeah you know and that's uh i kind of got away from that you know if i had somebody come in they pretty much had their mind made up on all that i i would I just tell them I was too busy or, you know, didn't have, I'd be honest with them. I didn't have any interest really in doing it. It's not really my style. Yeah. Uh, 
but I had, again, I had so much to do already that I could do that. You know, I I painted, uh, we did service work, we did all that stuff and I could do that. But, uh, yeah, I I could see that. I, I don't know. I I just kind of try to stay away from that kind of stuff. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Like I said, it's, it's the whole industry is changing in the sense that like, you know, I feel like there's a lot of there's a lot of people in the industry now or in like our small part of the industry that don't know a lot of the things that took place 20 years ago Yeah, that don't know who Billy Lane is that don't know who a lot of these guys are and um, the way people get things done now is completely different than it was 10 years ago yeah you know like almost everything is through online which is fine you know because that's allowed everybody to connect with different people all over the country. That, yeah. You know, some people do live in Dallas and there's tons of brick and mortar shops, but then there's people that live here. Yeah. That there's not nothing around. So yeah. fuck it. I'm going to order the parts and me and the guys are going to put it on the garage over the weekend, yeah. you know? So I understand that. And I think that that's definitely something that's always taken place and always will. But now it's also like you, it, it just, I was talking to fuck who it was somebody last, last last week or something like that i was like oh my buddy adam garley you know he's a he's a builder out of dallas he was on like builder bus a long time ago a uh-huh. fabricator you know a very meticulous guy when he builds a bike and he got he got burned pretty bad on a build uh that we took to sema in 19 i believe oh really customer kind of left him high and dry fucked him out of quite a bit of money oh, and just, man. it was a beautiful bike you know what i mean and and he just kind of got jaded by yeah. a lot of things and and we were talking, it's like, man, this is nothing looks like it looked back in 2009 or eight, whenever, yeah. you know, we were doing this stuff together then. And it's just different. I'm not complaining like it's different as in worse, mm-hmm. but it's just different. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, it is. It is. Uh, I was lucky. I don't know. I never really had many customers that, well, I, I don't, I can't think of any right offhand that. I, I had that happen. I've been very fortunate that a lot of the guys I've worked with, they just kind of, I never had an issue with payment, never had an issue, you know, getting shafted like that. Uh, I've been pretty fortunate. A lot of the people that I've met uh, and built bikes for have been, they've liked my style, they like what I did, and mm-hmm. they just kind of turn it over to me for the most part, you know, with some exceptions. You know, I want to do this, want to do this particular thing, but... For the most part, I've been really lucky, mm. you know. That's good. Yeah. Yeah, that's, a, that's you know, like I said, it's just one of those, like, observations, I guess, that I've just had over the last couple of months of, you know, going to Sturgis every year and, and, yeah. and trying to do Born Free. And Born Free is such a new thing, too, yeah. to our industry. And, uh, you know, it's just it's just different. But I don't know, I guess after you – I mean, if anybody's been in, in an industry for over 10 years, like, you can say that – you know, you've seen change, yeah. if you will, you know? Yeah, it's hard to believe. I mean, you know, I'll hear guys that and, and they just kind of got into the scene and they'll talk about somebody that's been in it for years. And I'm like, you know, they'll say he's been in it for 20 years or whatever. And it's like, man, I, I look back and I've been in this thing that long, too. You know, it's kind of hard mm-hmm. to believe. It's just time flies by you know i'm no longer a, a freshman you know? yeah. i still i still feel i'm in that freshman phase you know yeah yeah it's a I, same man i i've like when you think of all the people that i idolize coming up in the paint game and even in the bike world i'm like when like there, i guess the in the back of my head i'm always thinking like when do i get to walk into that door and be on that stage with those guys yeah yeah but it's never like this cut and dry like I'm there. It's like you slowly start yeah. getting to go to the stage and slowly get closer. And then next day, you don't even notice when you actually were on. Exactly. It's just, it's just bam. Like now, now you're a player. In it. it's yeah. Like, then you can't believe you got the recognition, you yeah. know, in the same crowds. Like, yeah. is this real? You know, I have to pinch myself. It's like <laughs> when, when I did the lictor exhibit, which yeah. you were too, you know, and I've had stuff that was in there or maybe my parts were on a bike or yeah. whatever. And I just kind of felt like I was part of it a little bit, but I, I, I never was really in it, you know. And then this year when I was asked to do the helmet, I was like, you know, I can't believe I'm actually in this show. You know, yeah. it just it seems surreal. Yeah, it's it was cool, man. I saw, you know, your helmets there, Jeremy's, uh, my buddy, uh, you know, Gerald from Valley Customs uh-huh. had yeah. one in there and some other guys as well. And it's it was an honor, you yeah. know what I mean, to do that. 
it um, would have been nice to have a little bit more time but, yeah, yeah. yeah i didn't I, I literally had to paint that thing like quick I, yeah. I don't even know if i flaked it or anything i might have yeah i didn't i didn't have time yeah but you know it was cool to do and my goal t- with the lecture thing is uh eventually i want to be able to say i had a bike that i built that was in there yeah some art on the wall and some photography on the wall yeah, that's kind of cool that's kind of what i want to get into uh eventually in some time and and also like i want to you know i haven't done a podcast with lecture yet but we we got something scheduled or we're working on scheduling something so eventually i'll have them on but i want to know and i don't mean to sound morbid with this but who carries that legacy on that he right. built over the last you know 20 years with with that uh that that show not to mention like his his massive amount of uh of history in the motorcycle culture and his and industry yeah that he has through magazines and his photography but how who who steps up and takes takes that over right you know what I'm saying right because there's not much i mean no disrespect to any of the shows out there in sturgis but that's the one yeah that you want to be in and it's not really a show like i got first place it's right. more like i'm being recognized yeah. for for my craft if mm-hmm. you will. so i don't know yeah it uh it's definitely an honor for sure yeah, the the Epics R show this year, man. I think we were kind of talking about it a little bit last, uh, earlier, dude. It so many nuts. fucking bikes. Yeah, so I mean, nice. I could not. That I, I probably had fifteen to twenty bikes picked as my pick, and I could yeah. not decide on a single one. And and just so happened the one that I picked, Paul from Bare Knuckle Performance had also picked it, you know. And uh, but it was just a simple, clean bike with a lot of detail and a lot of subtle much like Corey's bike you know you you if you just walk by and glanced at it you know you may not think oh yeah. it's just a fxrt or something you know mm-hmm. but when you really start digging into it and looking at all the little details i i, I just i still had to pick it you know even though yeah. it was chosen but there's a lot of high high quality bikes and it was just hard you know i wanted to give them all a trophy or yeah. something you know i just felt bad but uh it was it was packed man it was there was a there was a fxr there that was kind of like a, you know the main drag when you walk through it mm-hmm. it was one on the on there and it was a gray one with like yellow or something in it and it had like a 120r motor in it yeah and i think it was built out of somebody built it out of colorado and it was hands down my favorite bike I think I know exactly which bike you're yeah. talking about. I loved it. Had you know, because I I like custom paint. I would prefer the bikes to have some kind of flavor to it, right? Um, you know, but you know, Corey, I was supposed to be a judge on that thing, and I kind of like. Oh really? I, yeah, I was like, I don't want to. There's too many nice bikes, and I have too many friends in the show right now. It's like, I don't want to be involved. I see. That was me too. That was I. I really I don't like being a judge because I have too many. Too many picks, you yeah. know. There's just way too many nice bikes. It's hard to nail one down, and then I have customers, you know, that are in there, yeah. and uh, I I didn't really want to be one either. But you know, Joe needs help with the show. Yeah. He can't do it all himself, so I still went ahead and did it. But uh, see, last year I gave away a, a flamed out helmet, and I was going to do that this year as well, and I just ran out of time to. It ended up becoming down coming down to I can do this for Lichter. Or I can do this for yeah uh, Joe and I was like well fuck Lichter's an opportunity that I hadn't had yet so I wanted to do that but I'll definitely come back next year with something to kind of you know redeem myself but I fucked myself by doing a helmet yeah you know what I mean if I just painted a panel or right or got Justin to make some cool little my machinist like trophy. little trophy yeah like, I'd have been okay but a full flamed out helmet flaked out but I made a great friend out of it the guy I picked last year was a uh, uh, Ramjet built the bike for this dude Hans, and uh, he lives out there in Montrose, Col- or Colorado. And he actually rode out and met us in San Juan in the uh, where Monument Valley is and stuff. Uh-huh. Uh, Mexican Hat, Utah. Stayed at this hotel we were at, and really cool guy. But now I'm friends with this guy because of yeah. his bike build that I had nothing to do with, but it was my pick. Yeah, and yeah, you know. same way with me. Last, not this year, but last year, uh, I picked shane vince and uh he lost his life uh, a few
few months ago yeah. and I almost I, I didn't have I couldn't I was getting a little choked up thinking about it I was kind of going to dedicate that trophy to him but I couldn't get it out you know yeah, whenever yeah. I was giving it away but he was another one that I met uh, through the FXR show through this community you know yeah. we've become really good friends and uh, I just painted a helmet for him a few months before that and then right after he got the helmet I guess it was a few months or a few weeks later he uh, he passed away but uh yeah this this industry i, I mean all my closest friends are yeah. from here they're not you know i mean yeah. i've got friends here but i've got a lot of really really close friends that come from this industry yeah. you Same. know still to this day and have been for years and years and mm -hmm. years some of my best friends yeah 100 percent, i agree with that yeah just you, you, people in industry like they just have more they they, under, they can understand your place in the industry yeah. and it's easier to talk to them because you're not you know you can just really bounce ideas and, and yeah. get real feedback about they can relate they, exactly they can relate to it so yeah it makes sense man like uh i need more industry friends yeah <laughs> yeah because i i end up getting drunk and talking shit about things in the industry to my friends that aren't in the industry <laughs> and they're like oh this, this dude jace is fucking crazy you know <laughs> but yeah i don't know it's a good time it's my friend uh, one of my friends told me a long time ago and and I, I, I realize this and I, I see it more clearly like that I do agree, but I, I try, I don't want to agree. But he said that when you're in the industry, it's hard to have real friends who are not in the industry or no, it's, it's hard to be friends with, with customers or, or people that aren't in the industry right. that want to be in this world because we're in the industry and it's something that they consume as a hobby. Yeah. Um, and, and it's really hard to have friends that aren't also on your playing field in yeah. this. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I agree. So. 100%. It sucks. I mean, I've definitely, every falling out I've ever had with anybody, they weren't in the industry. They were essentially a customer that was cool that hung around and then yeah. things started going sideways at some yeah. point. So. Yeah. It happens. But. Yeah. Not playing too much. So, what else you got going on this year? Are you doing, uh, other than Born Free, you got anything else planned? Or you just oh, trying we're to doing the Smoky Mountain, Harley Davidson. Uh, the V-Twin? Yeah, V-Twin yeah. Visionary Show. I think that's uh, like the second week of October. Mm -hmm. uh, third week of October, they're having uh, some kind of bike blowout in Benton, Missouri. I think the uh, Martin Brothers, Joe Martin's going to be there mm -hmm. uh, with some bikes and a lot of stuff, drag racing, stuff like that okay. going on there. And then the following week is Born Free. Nice. And uh, I think that's pretty much it. Uh, we were thinking about going to SEMA, uh, but I don't I still, that's kind of on the fence. But after that, if we don't do that, next thing will be Daytona Bike Week. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't even thought about SEMA you know, ever since the pandemic stuff. Yeah. And I remember they were trying to bring it back. And the last time I heard, a lot of the paint companies pulled out of there. Yeah, they did. We so, went last year, and it was definitely down yeah. big time. Yeah. I don't know, man. The industry's getting weird. It is. On that side of it, at least. Yeah. Uh, yeah, because I used to love going there for all the all the really one-off wild cars that yeah. you'd see. And then, you know, there'd always be cool bikes there, but the paint was the main draw. Right. Um, just getting with that world. But PBG pulled out, and... I don't know what the fuck's going on. You know, Sherman Williams owns like House of Color, Matrix, and uh -huh. all those people, and they're just doing a shit job at, at what they do, in my opinion. Right. You know. Yeah. Um. Ha that hell, even like PBG, apparently right now they can't even get a lot of their toners. Really. For paint, yeah. At least in Dallas, they're having a problem with that. Oh wow. So a lot of people have been switching brands just to find people that have like. It's crazy. You know, uh, not just toners, but like the uh, the binders that they need to you know mix into the paint. Yeah. Um, it's fucking insane. I'm glad I only do helmets, really. <laughs> if I was painting a car and I couldn't get the color, Man. You know, think about that. It's fucking wild. I don't know. Well, it's cool. I just, you know, wanted to come out and, and shoot the shit with you yeah, for a man, minute. Yeah, man, glad you did. I appreciate it. It's been a it's been a good minute since I was out here last time, or you were on the podcast, so. Yeah. You know, I appreciate you Yeah, man, taking no the problem. Time anytime, Friday. anytime you're in the neck of the woods or we're up your way, we'll hit you yeah. up. You know, maybe when we're there for Born Free, we can come out, yeah. get some guys together and do something. Yeah, yeah that'd be fun, man. I thought about doing, like, a little podcast set up, but I really hate doing events because, like, it's always hard to get people to sit still. Right, yeah. During, like, a Sturgis or something like that, you know, because they're like, oh, let's do this podcast. Like, like they'll, you'll be down to do it on your way there, but then when you're there, there's get like there, so, you, much so much going stuff. on. Yeah, I get that. You're yeah. like, oh man, 
I want to go hang out with the friends, but I need to do this podcast real quick. And so you get like a yeah. little bit of an urgency uh-huh. in your guests. And it's like, I don't want to do that. I want I want the main goal for this moment to be this podcast and not like yeah. like a secondary thing. If yeah. You know. It is the perfect time. Everybody's together. But yeah. it's not because everybody wants to be together and doing right, something else. Right, right. So. Yeah, I get that. Well, cool, Brad. They can uh, they can get all your stuff at deathmetalracing.com. Is that yep. what it is? That's it. Deathmetalracing.com or boostedbrad.com. Either there you one. go. Yeah. All right. Thanks, bud. I appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, man. Thank you. And there you have it, guys. Boosted Brad back on the pod. Was stoked a bit to finally be able to talk to him again and uh, see some of the recent builds he's uh, done in person. And they never disappoint. They're always badass. They're always top notch. They're always inspiring to look at. So. Thank you, Brad. Keep pumping out bad thing, badass things, not bad things, and uh, much success to you in the future. Also, guys, thank you for listening to these podcasts. I uh, got a couple more coming out of this Nashville trip, and then got a couple bangers coming in early October as we gear up for Born Free Texas. That's right. We're going to have a booth there. We're going to be selling some one-off t-shirts that you can only get at Born Free Texas. So hopefully you guys are making the trip, coming down, and uh, it's going to be a good time. I think it's October 22nd and 23rd at the Yellow Rose Canyon. And uh, yeah, we're going to be there. So you guys have a good one. Don't forget to support the podcast. Check out the sponsors. Jump into our Patreon. And uh, we'll see you guys on the next one. Peace.